Come on. They're right there. Let's go. Move, 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 move. This episode of Choices Not Chances podcast is sponsored by Louisiana Gun Shop. Located on Highway 90 West in Broussard, Louisiana, just south of Lafayette. For more information, stay tuned at the end of this episode. This is Choices Not Chances podcast with Ryan and Matt. I'm your co-host, Matthew Charette. Sitting next to me is Ryan Rogers. Ryan. Hey guys, thanks for coming back. And just like always, if you see something that resonates in, uh, within you during this episode, we just ask you to go ahead and share that out to your community, share it out to your social media, share it out to the people that need to see this information. And, um, and don't be selfish. Today we have Ash Hess as a guest. Ash did 22 plus years before retiring out of the Army. Um, and during his time, he did one deployment to Iraq, three to Afghanistan, and uh, worked in multiple regions there. Um, towards the end of his career, after witnessing combat environment sh- style shooting, Ash was instrumental in rewriting the shooting doctrine for the U.S. Army, uh, which has not been replaced since. Ash then moved out. He does a lot with uh, long range shooting competitions. Uh, matter of fact, ha- has his own brand of shooting competitions that we'll talk about today. And he also works for Knights Armament as a military sales lead. Uh, Ash and I sat down and ha- have a great conversation right here. And I hope that you guys uh, take something from it. We talk about short barrel rifles uh, versus AR style pistols with the brace. There's new legislation coming on that that, uh, that we get well into the weeds with uh in this conversation so i enjoyed it it was 90 minutes of insightful conversation about shooting and and all things guns and i hope you enjoy it too all right ash hess thanks for joining us and uh looked forward to having this conversation as we talked offline a little bit i told you that you know i've been kind of following you on linkedin following uh the different things you're doing from shoots to uh, different initiatives you have there at Knights Armament, and uh, and I mean to get into it, and I want to share it with uh, with the listening audience. So thanks for coming on. Awesome, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I, I guess first, let's just do a little back brief on uh, on yourself. Um, I know that you uh, you know from looking l- doing a little bit of research, you were in the Army for uh, an entire career, and we talked a little bit out- offline about what uh, what your career entailed. But once you uh, once you Give it to me in your words one more time about uh, about your career leading up as a scout and things of that nature. Right on. Yeah, so I came in in 95. It uh, wasn't a lot that happened, you know, typical 90s Army, you know, shenanigans. And then uh, about the time, just before the war started, so probably end of you know, 99, 2000-ish, mm. uh, put in for a reclass packet. So I changed from engineer uh, and then went over to the cab. And as I was waiting for my school day, September 11th happened. So I went from basically going from guard. I was at 10th Mountain Division at the time. Went from being on guard as a division, getting ready to deploy to Afghanistan. And they sent me off to school and became a, became a scout. Uh, from there, I did one Iraq deployment, did the invasion, um, which is kind of cool. We, did, we were the only battalion-sized element that was not in Kuwait when the war started that fought on the ground war. Because remember, they get into the ground war like right, around, right in April 15th or whatever they called it, mission accomplished and all that. Um, so we deployed. We had three days three days notice to deploy to Iraq. So I did one one Iraq tour and then did three Afghanistan tours with uh, 10th Mountain, 3rd uh, third, third Squadron, 7th First Cav. A bunch of cool things came out of that, out of that deployment. We had a uh, Medal of Honor, and then we also built uh, what became known as Cop Keating. And if you're familiar with any of the stuff mm. with Cop Keating, uh, we built that place, had some battles there beforehand. Um, we, we got a little bit luckier than those guys did, but did all that. And then after my third tour to Afghanistan, I had been in the same unit for eight years at that point, which is which is not typical for Army, but and they were just kind of like, hey, go find a job. Uh, so I ended up at, at 10th Mountain College, the Light Fighter School. And they have a marksmanship program there, uh, urban operations mount, whatever you, whatever you know it as, uh, course. 
machine gun course. And basically I did some air assault schools uh, instructor for a while. And then they handed me that. And that led into, that was around 2012. And that led into a whole bunch of things that I got to do in the army. So that the, basically the twilight of my career from 2012 to 2018, uh, I got more done in the army than I did all those. The deployments were good. You know, we did get stuff. We killed bad guys and did all that, all that stuff. But the, the things that I got to do after that, were super cool. Um, ended up being at the uh, infantry school as the last, last job title was a marksmanship program developer. And basically in that, I had the doctrine which is tc322.9 for the army uh that's how to shoot rifles i had that doctrine i rewrote that book we got that published and that caused a bunch of problems and then from there we changed the army qualification and that's the first time that the qual had actually changed since 1959 wow so and and the book had changed since 1974. There was a, there was a couple little minor things in there, uh, adding in optics and just some, just some basic maintenance stuff since 74. Um, so we got we got two things across the finish line that hadn't been done in you know lifetimes, right? Uh, so now now when I go into any kind of army base and there's there, if you pass by the uh, the record fall ranges, there's barricades on them. That was something we got pushed through. Um, so, and that was, that was all between 2016 and 2018. Uh, that, that's something that, you know, we, we always talk about improving your foxhole, right? And I, I know you're a Marine and you're, there's, there's some sort of make the position better, right? So always. You got to stay. And to be able to sit here today and be like, well, there was one thing that was in the army that there was, it was negligent, right? You, you can take to whatever level of, of negligence, but we deployed thousands of people since 1974 you think all the all the operations that we did and there was no army check there were squad leaders and stuff like that but there was no army check to see if you could change magazines under stress it, it wasn't there it was mm. all super scripted and it was all sort of stuff now in the qualification you have to do three magazine changes four position changes and you do all that in three and a half minutes <clears throat> so to, to be able to sit here today and be like, hey, you know, we pushed this across the finish line in the Army. And now, since 2020, that became official. It, it, when I left, it was on its way. It takes some time. Uh, since 2020, the Army has been checking to make sure that everybody can reload their magazines. They can do all those sort of things. They can reload under stress, mm -hmm. shooting from different positions, shooting standing, shooting standing supported, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, that that's just something that I look back on with. With, with some pride just because it, it hadn't been done um sure so, but in that i kind of got got to know some people got to know some industry and all that sort of stuff and six months before i got out a uh, nice arm got a hold of me i came down to florida and interviewed and uh they they sent me an offer and so i had a job basically i was waiting five months to start a job at nice arm as a military sales guy um and it the cool, coolest thing about that is way back in 2014, the nice armament rep at the time came up to 10th Mountain and did a demo. So oh, sweet. as we were watching dudes shoot guns and we're shooting nice armament guns and we're having fun, I was like, you know, when I get out, I want to be that guy. And I, and I was talking <laughs> about being a guy standing there with all the best gear, you know, he's wearing Arc'teryx stuff and he's got, you know, the cool boots on and he's rolling around within a Suburban full of machine guns and it was just great, right? And I was like, I want to be that, <laughs> you know. Thinking of just kind of being, you know, in the industry, being a, being a rep. And I ended up, you know, four or five years later. Being that guy. That. Yeah. And yeah, so that's it, awesome, it's though. Kind of, yeah, it's just, and, and it, it was all, it was all opportunities, right? And I was kind of in a position, especially when I were changing the fall. I was the E7 that had, at the time, I had 18 years in. I was the E7, had a bad attitude. I had something that I wanted to fix. I had an axe that I wanted to, that I had to grind. And so when the opportunities popped up, I just took them. I wasn't worried about career. I wasn't worried about ch ch punching sure. that ticket. I had something that I wanted to fix, and I just kept pushing until I got fixed. Um, come to find out years later, the 10th Mountain Division commander at the time when I'd run the stuff up there was the trade-off commander. And I had some had some help from on high had the trade out commander going hey that guy's writing good stuff so we need to get that approved and he got 
got help from the, you know, you got the chief of staff to help grease it along, grease the skits and all that stuff. So I actually had help all the way up to, you know, back channel help, but all the way up to the top. If I'd have been putting up screwed up products, that it, it wouldn't have flown. But I was, mm -hmm. you know, doing products that were good enough and had some at least knowledge and vision from, from you know, the top of the mountain. Uh, sure. And it was just cool, just just grabbing opportunities as they popped up. Uh, yeah, like like I said, I did the, the combat stuff. You know, super cool. You know, we did great things. You know, went we, you know, smoked bad dudes. We lost some dudes, and those were great. But all that led to something that was cool that I could change the army with. Uh, and then you know, doing since then, been doing nice army stuff. And then, but with that, and then this is kind of where I was trying to get to, but but it is important for the story. Uh, the day before I retired, I was the marksmanship program developer for the entire United States Army. I was at the infantry school, infantry school the proponent. The sentences that I typed, if you're, you're going to shoot your gun this way, that's how everybody, and it could be like the last one, it could be 40 years before that changes. Right? Yeah, yeah. The, the day I retired, I wasn't that duty. I was the former, right? I did it. It handed it over to another guy. I wasn't that duty. So while it's important to the story to, to understand the past, I'm, I'm not the type of dude to, to leverage. Not, not leverage is the right word. But I don't live there, right? Sure. I, I live with what I'm doing today. I want to be, you know, I want to be super cool today. That That's part of the story which got me to the spot. Uh, <clears throat> so I was always talking about, you know, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn a little bit at the time, but I was always talking about shooting. That was, that was what I was talking about. I was trying to get, you know, support, was trying to get answers, talk to guys that are instructing, like highest level instructors, Kyle DeFore and Steve Fisher and those guys that are doing it professionally and contracts and all that, talking to them. And I was like, man, I'm not that dude anymore. So we started shooting long range stuff. And it was, it was good for nights because we were using nights guns. We were shooting long range, you know, shooting PRS series. They had a gas gun series that was, you know, using AR, AR style guns. And uh, I did fairly well. And that that season, I ended up fifth in the in the tactical division, which I didn't think was going to happen because I, I was a knuckle dragger dude, right? <laughs> and it was, wasn't sniper, didn't do any of that sort of stuff. Um, stayed far away from sniper shooting, you know, just that that's not what I wanted. Sure. But, but then when I got out, that was kind of what was there, right? And it was easy and it was cool. It was easy to get to, not easy shooting, but it was easy, you know, easy to act. It was good for the company, and so we started doing that. Well, that that series ended that same year. And so we were at a place called the Arena Training Facility, and one of the old uh, battalion star majors from Ranger Regiment works there. And we were talking about not having a match to go shoot. You know, like, this is a bummer. We don't have anything. Mm -hmm. And he was basically like, hey, dude, stop being a pussy and run your own match. And we were like, I was like, mm, okay, I guess we can do that. You know, the worst worst can happen. We come up here, we shoot guns, we have fun. And that turned into quantified performance. Um, we, our first match, we had like 50 people at. And we've been having about 250 people. We started that in 2019 had about 250 people per year competing in, in our matches, and it's just kind of grown. It was just one match, one or two matches in Georgia, one location, a couple times a year, it's done. And now I've got matches happening from Pennsylvania all the way down to Florida, and from Florida all the way out to Nevada. And wow. with, with people in Alaska, talking about shooting, a, trying to get one going in California. Uh, we've got, we went from two events per year. This year we're gonna have 26 with a possible of going up to 28. Wow, and that's great. When, when we started that, you know, when I started long range shooting, all I had was the, and, and, it, and I, I t say it to myself this way, as a bullshit that I've been putting in the marksmanship manual, right? It's, it's all good stuff, but that, that's all I had, right? And that, that's how I feel about it, that it's, it, it's good, but it, you know, it feels like propaganda because I've been typing it so much, you know, just trying to, trying to beat on it, just saying the same words over and over and over again. But, that's all I had. I literally, literally had that knowledge. <clears throat> I had a gun that was good. I had ballistic data, and I had a good scope. And had to execute long-range shooting, which I hadn't hadn't been. You know, I got buddies that are snipers, but I've never been to a wind class, never been to a range estimation class, never been to any of that stuff. Um, so, and that's, as we built quantified performance, that's what I'm trying to, you know, give back. Because we, we've got content that's involved in, you know, teaching people stuff, and that, 
that content, we, we made it super expensive to be a member. It's a dollar a month. So <laughs> it's not free content, but dollar a month, ain't nobody getting rich off that. I, I can tell you that right now, right? Sure. Um, so, and that's just kind of what I'm doing. Just, just I do military sales and I disarm it, and I, then we run the quantified performance. And that that's the short version. And, it, you know, and we'll get more into depth and, you know, on stuff like that. But that that's basically kind of where I'm sitting at right now. I did, I did forget to mention the uh, the handgun uh, manual right after I got out at a, a place called Victim of Security Services that I've been doing. Mike Pannone wrote a book with them. It's the M4 handbook. Pretty much everybody's seen that. Uh, the M4 handbook, Mike Pannone and Eric Lawrence. Been clothing sales and, you know, all over bases and everything for years. Uh, that same company reached out to me uh, about doing the doing an update to that book and then the uh, M17 manual. And I've been involved just from from my position, been involved with the M17. Got to shoot like one of the first M17s that showed up for vetting, all that sort of stuff. The the armor course and all that. So we just took that that shooting stuff that I had already packaged over here, turned tuned that into there, and I uh, did that book. And I published last year I published I, I don't i don't push on the lot because i'm not sure still how to leverage that um and, you know just and that, that's kind of one of the reasons i started doing a lot more on linkedin was trying to figure out you know what authors are doing on linkedin and that that kind of spun into something else um so i've been able to get get a lot of things recorded get a lot a lot of my ideas you know on shooting into some places that people look at and you know it's just kind of kind of kind of short short version yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was that was awesome. And if you don't mind going back, we're, I'm probably going to have questions going back. When um, you said you did one one pump in Iraq and three in Afghanistan, right? Yep. Okay. And then after that, you come out uh, and you kind of revamp or revolutionize the the shooting doctrine for the entire army as far as the infantry goes. Now, I guess my question would be. Was it your last couple of deployments or all of your deployments where you're picking out these things that we are weak on as a force and then you, you know, you get to a point where you can make change and you implement the change? Or was this something somebody already was working on? How'd this go? It was, it was I mean, basically the, the <coughs> throughout the deployments, well, the, you know, and there's, there's little instances, right? Uh, so in Iraq, Shot a dude, hit him two times. You know, it was a propaganda. Shoot, you know, two times, and he's gonna fall down. And he's gonna be dead. One shot, <laughs> one kill, maybe two. You know, that that sort of thing, right? And the first time you shoot somebody, and they don't do that, you're like, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. You know, every everything. I'm... Sorry, I had a call come in. No worries. Maybe that wasn't a lot, but you know, it was just you know things things weren't exactly right. And then, then uh, and that was Iraq. And then first Afghanistan tour, there's someone just sat with me, and I fixed it. Right, I, I fixed this thing, and it was, it, you know, and personally, that was one of the biggest fixes. But we had a, we had a massive contact. We had four year fifty AQ Taliban dude shooting at us. They were shooting dishes. We had A tens coming in. It was, it was a massive fight. Um, in the middle of that fight, we had a kid that was fairly new, and he was he was with his team leader, and he just stopped shooting. And you know, team leader's doing his stuff, and he's he's blasting stuff, and he looks over, and he's like, "Why aren't you shooting?" And the kid's like, "Well, I need permission to reload." Hmm. And the team leader's like, "Yeah, dude, reload your gun and shoot, right?" And it, you know, you're just solving the problem right then, right? Mm -hmm. But thinking about that, and like I said, the army was very regimented on how they did their call. You got told to lock and load, you got told to engage, you got told to lock and clear, you know, ceasefire, lock and clear, and then you got told to lock and load. So so that kid had been indoctrinated to wait for permission from the tower to load his gun. Even yeah. though it was a fight going on, and, and most most people went past that, right? And they're just like, I'm reloading my gun, I'm doing work, I'm not, you know, they were able to separate that. Sure. The, the kid was six months in the army, Hadn't had a good time up until then, you know, got in trouble and some other stuff. So we were making him do push-ups and, you know, doing his stuff. And I'm probably guilty of it too, but we weren't training the kid because he was always in trouble. Mm -hmm. We were, we were correcting him. We weren't training him on those things. Right. So, but that sat with me 
and and it just sat there and it was just it was just something you know, it was like princess of the pea it's just something that's unimportant it just irritates you and you just it's just something that's sitting on the shelf um and then just every deployment had little things like that and then in between the deployments we started shooting more uh, i had some friends that were were working with the uh, program called the apple seed project and apple seed is super solid for basic you know when you first start start shooting I always recommend everybody's like, hey, what course should I go to? And I'm like, have you been to an Apple Seed? That, you know, that that's like, it's like the primer for all kinds of stuff. Uh, we started shooting Apple Seed. And the way the Apple Seed, because you've been on ranges with, with, with soldiers and Marines. And when you're teaching them to shoot, and it takes you like 10 hours to get through to finally group, right? <laughs> and you're, just, you're saying all your things and just using not grouping well. And... You have the advantage of everybody's got standardized sights, everybody's got standardized weapon, everybody's got standardized you know ammunition. It's yeah. all standardized, right? And so at some point they pass basic training, unless you're doing drill instructor stuff, they pass basic training. So they got taught to shoot before, because you still have problems with them. Well, Apple Seed has taken anybody that shows up, and you could be anywhere between 18 and 80 with any kind of rifle, 22, all kinds of sights, anything that shows up, and in three hours, they've got them grouping. And in about six hours, they've got them passing with basically the Army Alt-C qualification, the, the paper target at 25. Mm. Uh, and they're passing that on different targets from standing, uh, prone, sitting. Yeah, standing, prone, and sitting. And they're passing that 25-meter qualification in like six hours. So I'm mm. like, there's, there's something to this, right, for that basic – grouping and zeroing your gun that level of marksmanship so i went to alpha seed and then i attended a I went to another deployment i went to a tiger swan class and i don't even know if they're in a course anymore tiger swan was started by a couple of uh delta sar majors uh, so it was you know real apical real time you know going to shoot and stand up fighting like a man all that all that sort of stuff and so i just got pieces of the puzzle and then one day they just they just hand it to me they're like, you do all the shooting stuff and make a good course. And we're like, but, um, so that, and that was at 10th Mountain when I handed it. And they were like, the only rule is it's got to be doctrinally correct. So we had all this good stuff from other training over here. And we opened the book and the book was terrible. Sure, it was just, but... yeah, it had, it had five different prone positions in it, but you could only use two of the positions after you'd pass the other three positions, even though they were better with these positions. And it was just like, why are you teaching five different prone positions? Yeah. Yep. From just, just make it happen. Yeah. Uh, so that got me tied in with the people that were writing the book because I, you know, I sent them an email. You know, days of old you couldn't do that. You'd have to go to Fort Benning and find the door and knock on the door and all that, right? Now we got this email thing. So I'm like, hey, dudes, this is what I'm trying to do. This is what I'm trying to go, and I can't do it because the doctrine is fucked up. So how do we fix the doctrine? And then they put me on orders, and they were like, you said it was fucked up, <laughs> fix it, and. So, but it was just, it was just, just to build up on that. And, uh, you know, like I say, being, having a bad attitude, being a retiring E7, you know, that, that, that opens up a lot of doors because the army doesn't know what to do with you. Cause they're like, Oh, I'll, I'll give you a bad rating. And you're like, I, I don't care. Yeah. So what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you're not going to get promoted. I'm not going to get promoted anyway. So what's up? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but it, it, it was good. And it all, it all kind of just, just stewed upon each other and just, you know, like I say, opportunity after opportunity, just pushed as far as I could on each one of those things. And sure. uh, it's been rolling pretty good. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to understand better because it seemed like you made mention of guys, you know, n well, you, you alluded to the fact that the new shooting qual has magazine changes in it. And that makes sense if you watch guys have issues with, you know, reloading magazines in combat so it makes sense and like along the way through my deployments i definitely seen different things um like that let's say but you know the marine corps does different things than the army yeah. i'm sure our school of infantry like there's a very heavy focus on uh shooting and magazine change and magazine retention in most of the things they do there so um Probably not better, but different. You know what I mean? Just do things different. Yeah, yeah it's different. And uh, we went way back in 2014. We went to the uh, the division commander and sent us down to the the 2014 Marine Gunner Conference that they do. The gunners all get okay, together. Yep. 
Quantico. And uh, we just sat in the back. You know, I, I, I had no business with anything with the Marine Corps doing with shooting, right? We just, I, we just wanted to hear what was going on and what their processes were and all that sort of stuff. And they, they were fighting through the same issues that we were. Uh, guys not hitting targets fast. Guys having, you know, slow reloads. Same arguments because there's a huge argument in, inside the Army about retaining magazines, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like you're, you're inside a house and you're, you're blasting dudes and you have to do an emergency reload. Do I need to take the time to stuff that magazine in my pocket while I'm in the middle of a fight, or can I drop it? You know, mm-hmm. it's just, it, it's, you're like, no, drop it, reload the gun and kill the target. And then somebody else that has some ranks like, no, you need to keep it. You've only got seven. And then it's, you know, it's four hours of dudes arguing about stuff like that. And that's, that's basically how I spent every day from 2012 on. Fun. <laughs> arguing, arguing with people. I mean, and, and literally, a lot, of, a lot of people say this, but literally, Every day, every work day since 2012, and pretty much every day since 2018, I've either been arguing about shooting, typing about shooting, shooting, or watching people shoot. It is just, it's it literally, I've, it's awesome. I'm a, I'm a professional, you know, whatever, whatever you want to take it, you know, typing about gun stuff um, and arguing about gun stuff I've, it, every day. Every day. <laughs> and, and as soon as, you know, like your podcast to come out, there'll be somebody that, you know, sees it that I haven't had an interaction with and they'll just be like, ah, she's full of shit. And then they'll find me on LinkedIn and then, then it'll start all over. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so it, it's vicious cycle. Yeah. Hell yeah. But, and, but I'm good at it now, you know, and now, now I can, now I can measure it, you know, just to, just to, you know, where it needs to go. For sure. For sure. Now your deployments in Afghanistan, where were they at? Uh, first one was we started out in, Damn, I just forgot the name of it. Down south. Um, in Helmand or? Coast. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we, we made it up. The last deployment, we made it right up, up against Helmand. Uh, first one was we started out in Coast and we ended up in the, up in Nuristan. Um, and then there's a, one, one of our guys, Jared Monty, uh, picked up, didn't pick up, but uh, earned the Medal of Honor up there. Uh, so the, the Monty Medal of Honor was around for that. Uh, there's a whole book, uh, Jake Tapper did it, called The Outpost. And, the first third of that book is it's three units in that book to get covered. The first third of that book, that was 371. Uh, Jared Monty, like I already mentioned, you know, cop cheating a little bit. We, we kind of built that, had some fights there. And then second deployment was Logar. And Logar, Logar was, was a weird place, um, but we did do some time like Shark and stuff like that in, in that center part of Afghanistan. And the third one, we start out in the Argonaut uh, River Valley. Uh, which was which was pretty terrible and then we moved over to when we first got there it was like bob ramrod or some stuff like that okay and it was basically right up against the helmet where uh the kandahar province and helmet province split you know yep. kind of that was the last army base you know going along there going west out of kandahar check pretty gnarly one there too yep and yeah, what was, years uh, were these uh, first one Afghanistan was first was 2006 2007 we got extended which is which was interesting uh, and then 2009 was Logar and then 2010 into 11 was uh, Argonaut gotcha yeah that was right when it was spicy as hell the whole time right yeah. there the, all those years gotcha check so um Okay, I got a couple other questions for you that's a little bit shifty, um, shift gears on you a little bit, but um, new legislation is coming out with the brace, in, uh, the brace rules. Can you break that down for me in layman's terms for the audience to say, what does it say? And as a law-abiding citizen, what do I now have to do You know, to, uh, to mitigate that being a felony or, or, okay. break, or breaking the law? And I don't break it down as, as, as much as I know. It's a 250-page document. Uh, but I do, do have some friends in some places, that, and we talk through this thing. But let's, let's start off and be super honest with the pistol braces, right? And I just want to say up front that I'm not supportive of the ATF. I'm not supportive of, of that sort of stuff. But, but we need to be honest with this a little bit. And this is the problem with the Internet right now is because we're, we're not being honest. So. Mm-hmm. Pistol brace, the pistol brace thing started in about 2012. Uh, up until then, if you, you could have like a little, if it was an AR pistol, 
you could have a little piece of foam on there on the back of it, but you couldn't shoulder it. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't put any sort of stock looking thing on there. It was, it was verboten, right? About 2012, uh, a police department was, you know, so I guess somebody from SB Tactical or somebody stopped by and a police department asked if they could put this, well, first thing, the brace thing got approved, right? 2012-ish, maybe a little bit earlier, the SB Tactical brace thing got approved for use as a pistol. Helping disabled, disabled people, you know, they could put it across their arm, have control of the gun, and that was what it was approved for. Well, then somebody asked if you could put it against your shoulder. And that was about 2012 era. And to that entity, and, you know, the ATF is very specific. They, they, if you write a letter to the ATF, they give you a response. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> Under your circumstances. But then everybody kind of kind of holds it against them, right? And then you're just, just laying it out on an on a honest, honest path. So... ATF said, we really can't regulate that. And man, the floodgates opened. Yep. Right. It was, it, you know, that, that, that little spot, and it probably took about six months for everybody to hear about it, but it was like the clouds parting and, you know, the sun beaming in, you know, it was, it was just great. Right. Because the problem with, I don't, I don't know anybody that, you know, I, I, you know, I'm one of the taxation step guys. Right. But, Strawberry rifle for our entire lifetimes doing an SBR required 200 bucks waiting for the ATF. Get your stamp back and you can have a strawberry rifle. That's the way it's been, right? Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. that's the way we know. And the problem with that is, and anybody in the ATF that happens to be listening to this because it's going to pop, the problem with that is, it's taken nine to 12, 13, 14 months for the stamp to get approved, right? If I walked into the gun store, and I was like, I'm going to buy that SBR. We did the paperwork, we did fingerprints, we did cheetah flips, whatever we needed to do for the ATF, fill out the form, you know, gave blood, you know, all that sort of stuff. Even 48 hours, right? 48 hours. I would prefer, like, right then, put the, put the stuff in there, and there's somebody that's like, good job, here you go, here's your stamp, right? Give me 200 bucks. I, I would SBR everything all the time, right? No problem. But it was... I paid for something, suppressors, suppressors are like, I mean, I remember a time when suppressors were like three years, right? Same thing. So what are suppressors part, now? Suppressors now are like a year still. Yeah, they're, they're still at a, still at a year, right? So yeah. some, some have been popping through like really quick, but on the average, it's like a year, right? So it's, it's this huge investment in time, right? I paid for something, right? Because I can't do any of this until it's paid for and I own it, that I have to wait for Mother May I, right? Mm -hmm. So... That precluded a lot of people from doing it. And it is a part of the plan, sure, whatever, right? But that was a problem. Well, when the pistol brace thing popped up, and I could put a pistol brace on, on a short bear gun. ATF wasn't, couldn't regulate, right? Grand Fork couldn't regulate if I put it up against my shoulder or not. Now I didn't have wait times. I can also carry a pistol across state lines. When you have SPR, you have to, you have to, you have duty to inform. Right. You're taking your SBR across state lines. There's a bunch of bunch of other problems to go with. So the pistol brace came in. They're like, "Hey, that's a concealed pistol. So if you have a concealed, whatever the concealed carry laws are, apply to that because it's a pistol." So many of us, I'm I, I don't even fake that I wasn't this dude. That's when I started getting into short barrel guns because I didn't have to get the stamp. I didn't have to do this thing. It made right. some really great pistol right. that, that I could put against my shoulder and because they couldn't regulate that, I didn't have to mess with SBR stuff. And that's what we'll say at least 75% of the people did, right? We got the pistol brace and we paid the whatever money for the pistol brace, just depending on what flavor you buy, you pay the money for the pistol brace and so I wouldn't have to pay the taxes and wait for an SBR stamp. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward, right? Everything was great in the heyday, and everybody's making cool pistol brace things. I use Gearhead Works. That's the, that's the brand that I use. Basically, that feels like an old Car 15 stock, right? It's a little bit wiggly. It's not quite right, but you know, and for that, it's great. It's not rubber. You know, it's hard plastic. Clips down. You can put it underneath your arm right here to get support. Awesome. 
Sure. And I was enjoying it. I'm on. I'm on the. You know, the uh, somebody did an article. We we have a, a local rifle match that was called an SBR match or SPR match, and basically shot from probably 25 yards out to 400 in this match. And I had Knight's Armament 11.5 on a on a Gearhead Works pistol, and I put a one to eight on it, and I happened to win that match. So I'm on the <laughs> internet. Somebody did an article about it, right? And it was just something that I, I just posted it up. I was just like, hey, I won this thing. You put a picture of the gun, and then somebody's like, it was a firearms blog, I think. Uh, and they were like, you won that with the pistol? And I was like, well, the SBR. And I was like, well, not really. I won it with a pistol. And they did an interview, and they did a better article on it. It was kind of fun. Um, but that is why, you know, me personally, and a, a lot of people that I know that have pistol braces did that, right? So that's that's the being sure. honest, right? It's not illegal. <clears throat> that's what we did. In the meantime, the AR pistol, as and this is something that they're not saying, you know, on the internet and all this sort of stuff. The AR pistol has been getting used a lot in Chicago. It's been a lot, been been a lot of gang things. It's been a lot of places, um, and that's just because of proliferation on it. I mean, you think about yep. think about 2010, and I don't know if you're still in Marine Corps or not around 2010, but there was very few people that I saw that were running around with SBRs. True. They did the short barrel rifle. Or you didn't get any velocity. You didn't get all this sort of stuff, right? Mark 18s was starting to get popular, and people were doing SBRs, but it, it wasn't. I mean, the vast, vast majority of guns, maybe a 14.5 that was pinned and welded or 16-inch guns. That's what everybody had. That's, that's, what, right. that's what you bought. And... I mean, it wasn't until until this pistol brace thing happened that people started getting into the short guns. Everybody wanted a Mark 18. Everybody wanted that sort of thing. You know, some people pushed along, went ahead and SBR because they wanted to have a real stock. Got it. And that, that started getting people into short guns. But, you know, until the, until the CQB craze is what I call it, until the CQB craze and then the Mark 18 and that sort of stuff, nobody was messing with this. So now, you know, fast forward into, you know, basically like, we'll say beginning of last year, you got a whole bunch of air pistols out there that's on the internet getting shown all the time up against people's shoulder, me included. I'm just as guilty. I, I mean, I got pictures of a, of a one to six and a one to eight on an air pistol, 11, five mm -hmm. um, podcast, podcast, all this sort of stuff. We're all on the internet. We're flaunting it to the ATF that we're doing this stuff. And then, then air pistol gets popular and starts getting used in crime. And the ATF created this thing, right? So everybody knew at some point the ATF was going to, even even if it was just down to the money, even take crime out of it. And the ATF realized that they were losing 200 bucks every time somebody bought one of these guns. They were going to close it. They were going to shut. They were going to slam the door in our face. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so that's what they did. Um, and that, that's basically what this thing boils down to. Um, I will give the ATF credit on some things because I read it, and then I got some guys in some places. And the people that were working on that, they they were actually not all of them, right? Leadership, you know, take some stuff out. But dudes that were actually in there typing, right? And then yeah, hanging yeah. on this thing. They were actually con cognizant of what they were doing, right? They created this gap that had, and I've, I've seen stories <clears> – <throat> Yeah, from 5 million to 40 million of these pistol braces that are out there, right? And the, the, the most popular ones were like SB Tactical, Gearhead Works, all that sort of stuff. And I know people like Gearhead Works, and if they would have sold, you know, would just say if they got one third of those sales, if they would have sold, you know, 20 million pistol braces at 200 bucks a pop, they, they'd all be driving like Lamborghinis and shit, mm -hmm. right? And they're not. Right, they're just, they're just good old boys doing doing their thing. So whatever that number is, whether it's five million, whether it's forty million, they were at least cognizant of those owners that did that, right? Yep, yep. And the proof in that is they waive the SBR fee, right? So they're still giving away that money for 120 days, right? From whatever December or January uh, 13th, they dropped it, I think, 14th somewhere in there uh, we're in the window now right so less than 120 days 
if you do the form one and jump through the groups of doing a form one, then they're not charging you the tax stamp. Right now, the stamp that you're getting is an SBR stamp, so it's not a it's not a pistol brace stamp. It's not something new. You're getting an SBR stamp, just like if you'd have paid 200 bucks mm -hmm. a year ago, SBR did. You're gonna get your SBR stamp, whether it's fast or slow, whatever. Um, and they, the other thing the internet's talking about is they've got 88 days to approve it. Otherwise, it's gonna be automatic disapproved from the time they do the background check, which is correct. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not 88 days from the day you submit. That's the 88 days from the time they do your first background check to approve it. They do the first background check. If I'm four four millionth in line, they're doing about 15 to 20 thousand stamps a month. So if I'm two million in the hole, when they get to my thing, two million, whatever you do that math to, when it finally get to my stamp and they do my first background check, then they have to finish the process in that 88 days. Gotcha. Um, now, I know all this sounds like they're going you know, to super supportive of the, of the ATF on this, right? But that's taken from the context of the ATF and SBRs have been something that's been longer than my life, right? And I spent 20 years in the government, and I now spent the next five years selling things to the government, right? Mm. And you can call that statist. And the, the government is going to do government things. And for the government doing government things, they didn't do too bad. Check. Now, all that being said, it's bullshit, right? It, the, 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 whole, the whole thing, the SBRs, all that sort of stuff, them closing the door, it's, it's bureaucrats doing bureaucrat shit. And it's not going to have any impact. On, on Chicago? Any, on, on Chicago, right? Yeah, yeah. Because that, that, that's why they're right. going to try to make the law, right? Right. So if you get if you got a guy that's taking an AR pistol and he's stuffing it down the front of his pants and he's pulling it out and he's shooting cars with it, he's not going to give a shit if he's got a pistol brace on it, he's got a stock on it. That's right. He doesn't care, right? So all these things, the assault, assault weapons ban, the only thing that the assault weapons ban did in 1994 that we had for 10 years, the only thing that did was set back small arms development for individual rifles for U.S. Army, Marine Corps, you know, everybody that uses rifles for a living. All it did was set that development back 10 years. Right. Army just spent like $200 million getting the getting the, news, uh, <clears throat> the new 6.8 by 51 next generation gun that we could have done, because if things were developing as fast as they are right now, because that development is coming from companies like Knights Armament, it's yeah. coming from companies like Daniel Defense, it's coming from these places because it's what do I, what can I sell to the you know next year? I've got to develop this gun, so that's where that development comes from. All these rails, because you know, we we had handguards that, that the Knights Armament rail, and because you came in in what 2003, 2004. Mm -hmm. so no, no, yeah, 04, 04. Yeah. So you probably had a nice armament rail on your rifle at that point. When I first came in, we didn't have that. You know, everything was shifty. So that rail wasn't bad, but you still get a lot of shift in that rail. Mm -hmm. So all these rails that don't shift and these 224 Valkyries and 65 Grindle and all this stuff, that's all commercial market driven. Mm -hmm. And during the ban, none of that happened because there's no money in R and D because you couldn't sell them to commercial market because it was illegal. Right? That's right. So assault weapons ban all that sort of shit has no effect on crime. Once it's out there, once you open Pandora's box, and, you know, somebody makes the, they, they put the, well, the 6.8 by 51, the brand new round, they've already got the 277 Fury. It's already on the market. You can buy that right now. And you can find that load. You may not be able to get that bullet particularly with their loading in it, but you can make that load. So that, that capability is already out there in civilian hands. You can you can stand on your head, gargle peanut butter, and you know, and spit nickels, and you're not going to get that back. It's not going back in the box. Right. It's out, there, right? So the criminal is going to use that in a crime. You and me, we're going to go out to the range. We're going to poke holes in targets. We're going to bang steel. We're going to have a good time. If we happen to need it for self defense, we're going to use it for self defense. But we're only going to use it in that mitigated period. The criminal doesn't give a shit. Criminal's right. going to do whatever he wants to do with it. So the punishment of us with the facade of stopping crime is all ridiculous. 
And, and that that's just where I sit on it. If, if, if there was something, we could have the argument and everybody's like, oh, you, you, the, the, the left is like, oh, we need to have common sense arguments and we need to have this thing and we need to solve these problems. We, you're not talking for real because I can't have an argument with me when, when you're talking about doing something that has no effect on the problem that you brought up. There's a problem, yeah. right? Nobody, nobody other than the people that are doing it. But nobody wants to see kids killed in schools. Nobody. We don't want to see that shit in Iraq. We don't want to see that shit in Afghanistan. We don't definitely we don't want to see that shit here. So that is a conversation that everybody would be willing to have if we were actually solving the problem. Fact. Right? But having a conversation with somebody that's like, hey, I'm going to take away your guns to do this. You're like, it's not going to fucking change anything. That's right. So I can't have an argument with you. Yeah. And the pistol brace thing is exactly in that. Right? Now... Is it a racket though? To... Are they going to make extra money off this? Can, can is that a motive as well? Because I don't know. After like the 120 days, the people that were they were holding out, then they're going to get their their stamp money back. But then once this is done, right? The pistol braces. We if you want to have one on as a felony, it's just like I mean I could go I could go take my 11.5 and put it on a you know a stock lower and have an illegal SBR, right? And that'll be, you know, the pistol brace thing will stop selling. You know, they, they might sell as like novelty items. Somebody have it hanging on the wall, you know, yep. all that sort of stuff. But everything might go back to, you want a short gun, SBR, right? And most of the people that don't want to, if, if, if I don't have a need for a short gun and I don't want to register one because the NFA straight up is a registration. It has been a registration the entire time. It's not something that wasn't a registration before and then they did the pistol braces. The NFA, you're literally registering your guns. So if you want to register your gun, or if you want a short barrel rifle, you've got to register it. If you want to be stay in that law-abiding citizen category. So we've got 120 days. Basically, you go in there and you do the form one. And I've heard a couple different stories. We're getting ready to do ours either the, you know, the end of this week. We're all going to go in together. Um, end of this week, early part of next week, we're going to go down. We've got a place called Longs and Shooter Supply that's got one of the cool kiosks, mm. and it's right down the hallway. It's inside our same building. So we're going to go down there. And we're going to start it and getting all our serial numbers together uh, because we need to maintain that legal status, right? So, and I highly recommend people staying in a legal status, right? Hey, uh, okay, sp spell that out for me. To stay legal, you need to register with the... Right. If you got a pistol brace, you know, either follow the rules, turn the gun in, right? Mm -hmm. Put a 16-inch upper on it, get rid of your short barrel. Right, turn it in, still back into it, and non NFA, you know, 16 inch, 14.5, whatever, non NFA gun, or register it. Right, that that's pretty much your choices right now. You you can you can get it registered, get it SBR, you can turn it in and get rid of it, or you can get it out of that configuration. Um, so it's not a bad process um, to to get it done. And I don't know how long it's going to take uh, to get it done, any sort of that that sort of stuff. Right. Um, but do your fingerprints, you put the serial number in, you do the form one. It's fairly straightforward. And you're manufacturing the rifle, so it's form one because it's already been manufactured, but you're turning it into, you personally, you're turning it into an SBR. Okay. Uh, so you do your form one, fingerprints, it goes through the process, however long it's going to take. Uh, but the difference between an SBR, like if you went and bought an SBR right now, you'd have to leave it at the gun shop until you got your form, right? So you could go, if you got a good gun shop, you'd go up there, hang out, play with it, maybe shoot it if they got a range, but it's got to stay there. Mm -hmm. The difference with this is if you have one that's on a pistol brace, submitting the form one, once you get the response back that the sub form one is submitted, and you have that back from the ATF, that covers you until you get that stamp. So I can be still be doing my pistol brace thingy, whatever. I wouldn't put a stock on it yet. Leave it as a pistol brace gun. It's you're in the process as a pistol brace. Run your pistol brace until you get your stamp. So that's the difference is you can keep your gun at the house. Yeah, if you already have it, you can keep it yeah. there and use your form one as your proof that you've started the and you can still run it however you want to run it. Right. Check. And then when the stamp comes back, all you do in the day the stamp gets there. You put it on the, put it on the Instagram, we're going to stamp day. And you, you take off the pistol brace. Put a stock on it or whatever. Throw it in the grinder, put your stock, you know, on there. 
I would suggest if you have pistol braces, start buying some tubes and buffers and all that sort of stuff. If you got weirdo buffers, um, buy some tubes, have some stocks on standby because with, with the industry right now, that shit can dry up like right now. <laughs> yeah. So, because if, if there are 40 million, if there's 40 million pistol braces out there over the next 120 days, 40 million people are going to be trying to buy stocks. Buffer tubes, right? Buffer and tubes. Buffer and tubes yeah. Right. I don't know. I'm not Magpul, so I don't know how many Magpuls got out there, but there's probably going to be a run on that stuff. So that's that's some fair warning on that. Check, but, check. So, and then that that's kind of the kind of the process on it, and there's no limit on it. So if you had, you know, 15, 20 guns that had pistol braces on there, you can get basically free tax stamps for that entire thing. Right now. Everybody's all up in, in it. There's going to be some people. I guarantee you, once this thing this thing's post, there's going to be some people that are mad. You see a bootlicker and all this sort of stuff. If you're a law-abiding citizen, that's what you got to do, right? That that's your choice. You either you know, check, check. law-abiding. That's the laws. That's the rules. That's the statutes. You can do that, or I don't, right? Um, if you don't, don't put it on the internet. That's, that's my advice on that. I, I don't want to hear about it, right? I'm not SBRing all of my guns. I'm just doing a few, doing, doing probably like five, which is which is not all of them, right? But I've, <laughs> I've got I've got four, got four or five pistols. So, and I I don't what I'm doing right now. I really don't need an SBR. I I, I have them. I'm going to retain them, right? I'm going to sure. maintain that legal status, and I don't. I don't fault anybody for their choice in it, right? I can see why not to do it, but that's running the gauntlet, right? And sure. I can see why to do it. So, I mean, and that, that's a personal decision that, that on the internet, like like if you were sitting right here and we were talking and we were drinking beer and some moonshine and we we're having a good time, we've been friends for years, and I'd just be like, hey, dude, that's fucked up. We can have that conversation, right? Sure. But us on the internet, I, I'm... See, yeah, I'm that's forever, and they'll they'll kill you with your own words, yeah. Well, well, that and I have no right to tell you what to do. Sure. Right? E- even if we were friends, I could heckle you for it. But sure, sure. This is the first time we've had a conversation, so, it, you know, I'm I'm not going to listen to other people that, with their opinions on it, right? I'm going to look, look at the problem set. If I don't do this thing, I'm going to be, once I get convicted, right, then I'm going to be a criminal and I'm going to be a felon, mm-hmm. right? And that rips everything, my entire, everything that I've been doing since 2012, that rips all that out from underneath me, right? Yeah. Now, with all fights, there's sacrifice, okay? And I'm not cool enough on the internet that my sacrifice would be worthy, right? Because because Barney Fife, they're not going to roll in here with black helicopters and do all kinds of stuff. Barney Fife's going to show up here with one bullet in his gun, He's going to be like, turn in your guns, and if I smoke Barney Five, then attack team's going to show up, and we're going to have maybe a little bit of fight, <laughs> and that's going to be in it, right? And nobody's going to care, right? I mean, it's, that's fact. Be hateful people, but but everybody's going to be like, oh, Ash got rolled up, and be like, oh, that's fucked up, idiot, and life moves on. That's right. Right? There's no go go fund me for it. There's no there's no get Ash out of jail. Yeah, no matter how bad you dislike the rule or don't agree with it, it doesn't matter. Like, they're still going to use it. They're they're still going to tell you you knew about it. It posted, and we're going to come get your stuff. And if you don't give it to us, you're going to be a felon. Like, they're not going to care how you feel about it. Um, yeah. and, and and you might go out in a blaze of glory, and that sounds really cool. And we're talking on the internet. If you're like, oh, if they come to shoot my dog, I'm going to shoot them all. And yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah. There's a lot of people that say that and the ATF, you know, knocks on the door and they're like, "Hey, give up your stuff or put on these cuffs. Your choice." And you're like, oh, "I'm going to put on these cuffs." And okay, okay, I'll go get your stuff afterwards, right? Mm-hmm. After I shoot your dog. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then I'm going to go in there. And I, I, I've got some friends that are in ATF, and that, that's my greeting to them: is like, "Don't shoot my dog, bro." Yeah. I just don't kill but, my animals. Yeah. <laughs> that's but, hilarious. And and that's that's just the you know just being honest in the reality of it, right? So. Then, you know, Feinstein's been talking about doing an assault weapons ban. She's been uh, talking about it for 93. She got it done in 94. 
stopped talking about it for a little while. Well, the president and mentioned it in the State of the Union last night. Yeah. So. And it, yeah. So, but I don't think that's going anywhere because here's the difference between 1994 and 2023. So in 1994, and Buddy and I were talking about this about two weeks ago. In 94, you had Colt, which was selling to the military. Yep. Had some very limited Knights Armament stuff. You had DPMS. You had Bushmaster. Yep. And nobody can even really think about anybody that was making ARs at that time. Right? That That's what we knew. Right? So you had a handful, and we'll, we'll say less than 10, because there might be some people that I'm forgetting, and if I forget you, I apologize, but we'll <laughs> say less than 10. Less than 10. That were beholden to the NRA to save them. Right? So you had a limited amount of money, and it was all with the NRA, and it was all the same NRA FUDs that, were, that are there right now were still there back then, and they were worse, because nobody had ARs. Right, ARs weren't popular. They they had been they were very low numbers before '94. They weren't popular. Sure. Uh, and you, know, you had some other things. You had the Mini 14, and you had some other things that were around in 556. But the ARs just weren't weren't the go-to. Right. So when I talked to our ATF inspector in probably 2019. Uh, he came down nights and did a big, big thing. And I was like, hey, how many AR manufacturers are there? Right. So the number that he gave me was 280 something. Right. AR manufacturers. Wow. Right. So now you're talking about 280 of various levels. Right. So you've got you've got the guy down there. He's got an FFL and an SOT and he's cranking out, you know, Joe Bob's lowers from, you know, Little Rock, Arkansas. Right. He counts on those numbers. Right. He's not making a lot of money doing, you know, two guns a year, whatever. You know, all the way up to Danny Defense, Knights Armament, FN, Colt, uh, Sons of Liberty Gunworks, all these big names that Mega that's doing stuff, Zev mm-hmm. that's doing stuff. Mm-hmm. You've got all these AR manufacturers out there. You've got places like Magpul that's making billion dollars a year off of accessories, uh, lights, lasers, optics, all these things that are focused on the AR market. That's a whole different money pot. And then you add that, and we're not beholden to the NRA anymore. We've got the uh, Gun Owners of America. You've got Firearms Policy Coalition. You've got all these other places that have popped up. Sure. To do that sort of lobbying, and you've got a lot of money behind it, and you've got a lot of lobbying behind it, right? Sure, so sure. So now, you know, and, and this sounds more rough than it than it I really intended, but by a senator, right? Mm-hmm. And everybody makes the jokes, you know, senators had all their companies on like a NASCAR, you know, thing. They'd, they'd have to wear a cape to have all their sponsors on, right? That's right. Um, but there's enough money now in this market that we can actually have an effect with lobbying, right? So that's on the lobby side. And then you look at what the Supreme Court's been doing over the past, you know, probably like eight years but you know there's a couple of them that are super important that are fairly recent you know with the bump stocks they that that uh district court or whatever that court is turned over the bump stock ban right said the atf couldn't do that i didn't know about that and then supreme court said and the reason that they did that is because the supreme court ruling was like was talking about i don't remember it verbatim but the supreme court basically lined out what the spirit of the second amendment is and historical use and gun laws, right? So it has to fit inside that definition. They just can't do that sort of thing anymore. And that's why it looks like California, I just saw a thing that the California governor was talking about that they were going to lose their assault weapons ban in California, right? California is like the place for the assault weapons ban, right? It was, it's like it's like the birthplace of it, right? Yeah. And they've, they've had one in place since 1994, and it looks like it's going to get overturned as soon as that court case gets Because there. of that uh, decision at the appellate because court? That, yep, because that decision the appellate court and the Supreme Court, they're, they're the way that, I forgot what case that was, but they're basically the way they lined out what the Second Amendment means in that case 
that precedent from the Supreme Court is messing up all these gun laws that are all the way down. So to try and do an assault weapons ban after now, that would be even harder than before. Yeah, it's even harder before. And then you take the money in there and it's not going to go anywhere. The, the crypt keeper is just up there. She's stomping on her things and, 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 and the president's up there and he's saying his things. Right. And the president can say whatever. And that, that's the thing. Another thing that I've been fighting since basically since Obama was everybody's like, the president's going to do this. The president's going to do that. It's like, Hey dudes, he doesn't do that. Yeah. He's a statesman and he signs it. He's the final signing guy before he goes over to the Supreme court to check for, check for constitutionality. Right. He just said, dude, he can stand there and do cartwheels and cheetah flips in the yeah. white house. Yeah. That's more of foreshadowing what he did last night and what some of these other congressmen and women are doing. It's foreshadowing what they want to happen, but you're oh, yeah. going to have to have bipartisan le- legislation on that to pass anything. And I don't, I don't see the right budging on much of that. And, 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 and some of these, you know, there's a, I forget the dude, I think he's from West Virginia. Um, I can't remember his name right off the top of my head, but he's a, he's a, a Democrat, but he's a, they call him a moderate, mm-hmm. but he listens to the argument and then he decides from there. So sometimes he sides with the right, sometimes he sides with the left, but the dude sits there and he. I believe that's how all of them should be, right? And, and that's, how, that's how they should be, right? And that, yeah. that's what should be happening is here's this thing, here's this good idea, Ferry, as they're going through there. Then everybody that's supposed to be voting on that should do due, due diligence on it. It's a fact. If they were doing that, things would be, everybody would be much happier. Things might not be any different, right? But people but would be happier. <laughs> yeah, we, we, if, if we knew that they were doing that, right? And, and it's not even that they need to do that. They're supposed to do all of that and then weigh that against what the majority of their constituents in their area under their ticket would want them to do. So, like, that's a big part of it, too. Oh. There are representatives, not our leaders. Right. right. There's, yeah, it's very strange. Terms, right. And so, in, in, in a, and I say this in a, in a context of, I've been doing gun shit like like I was I've been carrying a gun since 1995. I've been talking about gun stuff my entire life right now. Mm-hmm. Other than other than riding motorcycles, my entire Hell life involved yeah. in guns. From 9 to 5 I'm I'm, I'm doing gun stuff and ice armament. From 5 until I go to bed, I'm doing gun stuff with quantified for performance. On the weekends I'm doing gun stuff and it's all AR pattern stuff, right? Sure. So an assault weapons ban I'm trying to find the exact word that I want but it nukes my entire livelihood. Everything that you've done and have been doing and continue to plan to do. Yeah, yeah. everything. From, yeah. from, my, well, my, from my, nine to, my, my big paycheck, my little paycheck everything I do, everything that I've done other than the army dudes and Glad that the army dudes are going to continue to have good stuff, but everything from then, I've got nothing, right? Yeah. Everything just gets wiped away. So, I'm going to fight every every step of that, but I'm going to find it smart, right? So one of the things we've got quantified forms. We haven't talked about that a lot, but basically it's rifle matches. So we did a little bit of data mining, and last year, our 500 members fired almost. 900,000 rounds of, through AR pattern guns and hit within probably about either hit the target or within about three minutes of the target for nearly a million rounds. Wow. So, and we watched me or my, my ROs, my staff watched every one of those rounds other than a practice, but we watched every one of those rounds go down range. Me and my staff can tell you during the matches where every one of those bullets went. Right? So when somebody goes up there and they, you know, they get on the stand or they get on the internet and they're just like, ah, blah, we do this, blah, 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 and, they, and they say words and they just make ridiculous arguments. And that's one of the things that I fight is stupid arguments. Right? Yeah. So 
they make stupid arguments. Oh, it's not a, you, you tried to ban clips and it's a magazine and ha oh, ha you're stupid. You don't know what it is. And you know, all those sort of stupid arguments. I try to fight it with reality, right? So if I can get on the stand, I can be like, hey, I have 500 people that I know of directly, 500 people shooting this many bullets with this many pattern things. There's no crimes committed by those people other than speeding. There was no NDs. There was no murders. There was none of these things. And other than the Army and the Marine Corps, you know, the DOD, that's one of the biggest places of supervising, or not supervising, but observing rounds being fired per year, right? Sure. If I bring in CAD or firearms instructors and other people that are running other kind of matches, and we roll in there with, with valid arguments, and we basically destroy all their sort of stuff, because the bump stock guy was the worst guy for our cause. What do you mean by that? But had, had all the videos that you saw when the bump stock stuff was going on, what was the bump stock guy doing? They're mm. just blasting rounds and nothing rounds accurate for sure. Yeah. And, and, and they're, they're shooting trees and they, they got their finger hooked and they're like, I don't even need a butt stock. And they hook their finger in their belt loop and they pull the gun forward and they shoot an entire pond. Right. And you can watch rounds going all over the place. Sure. That did not help our cops. Yeah. Right. And I got it. Fight the power. Do that. But putting those videos up did not help us because that's the video that they're going to eat when they're, when they're doing their, doing their, their push. That's the videos that they're going to show. They're not going to show you and me shooting well. Right. They're going to show this idiot doing bump stock stuff. They're going to show the gang member pulling an AR pistol out. They're going to show people, you know, doing, doing these, these mass killings and all the stuff with the ARs. They're going to show all the bad stuff. That's right. You're literally feeding them bad stuff, right? Things that they can use against us. So fighting it in a smart, articulate manner and pushing on, you know, and it, COVID was one of the best things that helped our argument. Because how that how does that work? Yeah. There, think about it. They're like trust the CDC, trust the CDC, trust this, trust that, trust this, trust the science, all the sort of stuff. Trust the government, trust all these things, right? And in that, every when it came to legal stuff, they all leveraged the FBI. They're like FBI says this, and anytime going against Trump, FBI, FBI, CDC, trust the government, right? Okay, we'll trust the government. FBI numbers, 4% of homicides are done with the long gun. 4%, right? Less than 1% of those are done with an AR. None of those are done with an SBR, an actual registered SBR. So we're trusting the science, we're trusting the government, right? So what this thing does, and it affects less than 1% of all homicide crimes. You don't think there's something else that we can do to try and do these other crimes? We're, we're only doing, well, 1% matters. And yes, a child getting murdered, that matters, right? I'm not saying that that 1% sure. doesn't matter. What I'm saying is this big grand sweeping legislation is nothing more than smoke and mirrors because it's going to do nothing for 99% of the crimes that are homicides and crimes that are happening out there. Yeah. That's what so, I thought was interesting about this, you know, about certain people speaking is they'll give you all the statistics and point to it being pistols that are used in most crimes and then, or in most gun crimes. And then they want to put the ban out on the assault weapon. And it's like, yeah. why are you trying to ban the thing that holds 2% or less of, of the incidents? And, and because they know they can't ban the other one without having right. yeah, the, pure the, upheaval. The, the, and, and they can't they can't get the traction to do that, right? To, to, to ban pistols, even semi-automatic pistols. You, yeah. you, know, you focus it a little bit more down. Even semi-automatic pistols, they can't get the traction because people are not going to sign off on that mm -hmm. because lots of people have pistols. Agreed. And lots of people that, you know, all that sort of stuff. And that... That's just where I sit on, on all the gun law stuff. Well, I'm not saying that yes to do something. I'm saying we'll have a conversation. We'll have a smart conversation. Yeah, if you want to talk about 
these things, right? In a very specific term. You want to talk about these things and being honest again, right? Sure. The AR platform, right? Or is a semi auto gun is used. And I think, I think I saw a thing that was 50 or 60% of the mass killings. One, you need to define what the mass killing is because the number changes depending sure. on, you know, mass killing is anybody more, more than two people wounded. It used to be 10, right? Lock in that definition, right? And then give me a stat after that. Well, let's have that conversation. Would this prevent any of those killings, right? <clears throat> a ban on these things would it prevent any of that. Yeah, that's why I said yeah. I think it almost looks more like a racket. They're made. They're going to find a way to make a little bit more money, and I don't think that they're going to stop much killing, especially not you know lawless killing. You, you may right. slow down a little bit of killing with that sort of weapon in self defense from law abiding citizens. You might, and yeah. I would say I would venture to say probably not enough to even notice. But you're not slowing anything in the city down. You're not slowing anything yeah. that's that's lawless or black market sales and 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 use you're not slowing any of that down you're just yeah. making the other people less equipped to deal with it that live right. in that population and and, and and you know and having a conversation on that right would be you know there, there's a hundred other things that we could say right because what's the police response time we, we, we'll say it's a it's a good police department in two minutes and being somewhere within your city or area district being some there with a gun and a car or somebody that was you know, doing whatever he was doing, writing a speeding ticket or eating mm. donuts, whatever he was doing in two minutes, having a cop there is pretty good. Pretty right? good. Yeah. But if it's something that we care about, money, there's somebody already there. There's somebody already there that can do enough to buy other people time to lock down all the money, right? Because the security guard's like, freeze, and they pay attention to the security guard. They might smoke check the security guard, but that gives time for somebody to hit the little panic button that locks down the ball, right? That's his job. Sure. So a more apt cause or a more apt effect at the schools is having somebody that can fight. That's the already schools. there. Yeah. It's already there. Yeah. Right. That knows the school because one of the things with, with the Texas thing was the cops hadn't trained in the school and they didn't know where the blind spots were and they didn't know where this was and just didn't know, didn't know, didn't know. I got a dude that's paid to be there. He's going to, he know knows all there. of the exits, all of the right. entrance. Yep. Yep. And he's, he's not going to be like, Oh, they're in room one Oh nine. He's going to be like, they're in Mrs. Smith's classroom. Her desk is on the far side from the door. No, the whole and, layout of the rooms. Yep. And, you know, and, and it's personal for him because he knows Mrs. Smith and he probably knows those kids. Absolutely. You know? you don't have to be his what, kids. what do you think the holdup is on that funding? Or having gun militarizing our schools? It's, there's there's pushback on militarizing our schools, which we don't necessarily need to do, right? We don't need to. We just need to have somebody capable in the schools, right, with the tools that's, that's needed, right? Yeah, a lot of um, schools do what? A lot of schools do this, uh, like a service officer now, where they'll have a deputy that's on right. standby, either you know in the public area or in the common area or in the office. And I still wonder if, you know, like at least the, the deputies at my kids at school, they're not coming in there with long guns. They're in there with their regular right. service, you know, pistol on a belt. And um, so I think a lot of places have that. But to actually, you know, have a security company established that takes care of schools, I don't see where there's a whole lot of hang up. So it's got to be funding. It, 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 it's funding and the perception. Right. And. It's just a people don't want to think about, they don't want to accept that schools are a dangerous place now, mm -hmm. right? And part of it goes back to the stupid fucking gun laws of the fucking gun safe zone, right? Because if I didn't know, right, Florida, you know, Florida in particular, other places, there's dudes just carrying guns a lot of fucking places, right? So I didn't know if there was a gun in there or not, but there was a high chance that there was. I'm less inclined to go shoot that place up. For sure. Because but if I know I, that by law, no law-abiding citizen is even allowed to have a gun there, makes right. for a I'm pretty soft target. Time, whatever I'm doing that for, 
right? Whether it's a terrorist act or whether because I'm mental or whatever I'm doing that for, I'm probably not going to have the time to do that. So I'm going to look for someplace else. I'm going to look for a soft target. That's right. right? Or something that instantaneously puts me on the news. Because that, I mean, why, why that's am I what doing they're after. Yep, that's right. I don't want to be on the news, right? And I know there's more to that, but it's a factor, right? Sure. And so we we basically presented them targets, right? We presented the, you know, we presented the, you know, sheep to the wolves. We're sacrificing them over here for the perception that they're safe. And that, that everything's okay. Safe. The illusion, yeah. Right. And it's that Pandora's box. And th there's been killings at schools for a real long time. There, there was a big fire that happened. You know, somebody burnt down the school in like the, the 30s and killed a bunch of kids. Crimes happened at schools. Th that's not new, right? But the notoriety mm -hmm. of Columbine, right? And those kids from Columbine, they, they got that idea. They went and did that. And if your mind was slipping, right, and you were looking for a way to do a thing, those kids are still famous. Yeah. You, know, you look at the videos of Columbine now, and you're like, man, the video quality was such trash, right? And that's still getting shown. It's still getting talked about. Hell, we're talking about it on this. We're, you know, and, and that was, you know, what, 98, 99, somewhere in there? Yeah, I think that we don't do ourselves any favors by talking about them, especially when they're yeah. – when they're hot on the press or like when it just happens, because that's what they're looking for. The notoriety yeah. and the fame and, you know, almost that, uh, Machiavellian, uh, yeah. you know, pers you know, that's what they're, that's what they're searching for. And we should make it to a, to a position where their names never brought up again. The incidents never brought up on mass medias. I, I don't yeah. know how we can do that because the media likes negativity and negativity sells and blood sells and, children's blood oh if you can get a school shooting that really sells oh, yeah. right and yeah. that's how sick we are uh as a nation because we're going to make those ratings go up when we see that but if everybody would just say nope as soon as you commit that act your name is done is stricken that we're never talking about it again yep. you wouldn't keep hearing about it which would you know kind of dampen the motive for right. these other kids that kind of want to idolize or copycat or whatever it is that they want to do. But me personally, like you look at any elite leader of any country, their kids all go to school with security guards that have guns on them. Every one of them. And then they try to tell you how safe it is and how you don't need assault rifles and you don't need this and you don't need to protect You Just let us protect your kids. And it's like, yeah, but your kids are actually protected by big guys with guns. Yeah. And yeah, I'm not even to, allowed in my school. They, they want a monopoly on violence. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. If, if you boil, if you boil all this away, why are they going after assault weapons, right? And you're like, you know, because it doesn't make any sense. They're, all their arguments of why they're doing it doesn't make any sense, right? Right. You're going after assault weapons because somewhere in their plans, right? Most, most people have plans on getting rich and famous and all that sort of stuff, but somewhere in their their doctrine and their plan, their strategy, somewhere in that, they're doing something that they don't want anybody to be able to fight them. Right? And that might be five years down the road, might be 200 years down the road. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. At some point, they're going to do something that they know is going to tip the scales and people are going to want to fight them. And they want to have those assets out of their hands. Yep. And they want to have, I mean, you think about this. Every veteran, every veteran since 1966 has been trained on an AR platform rifle. That's right. So even if that guy did one tour in Vietnam in 1969 and I hand him a brand new nice arm and SR-15 top of the line, super scope on it, you know, $10,000 worth of gun and lasers and I hand it to him in a magazine, you know what he's going to do? You know, stick the magazine and he's going to rack it and he's going to be like, how do I aim this shit? Because I only do iron sights. And he's going to look through that scope and he's going to be like, I could smoke check motherfuckers right now. I used to be good with the two, with the two peep. Give me a scope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Yep. And so that's every veteran. Yeah. And as the ARs got bigger after 2004, because I could say before the ban, they weren't big. But after 2004, a lot of non-veterans have been shooting AR platform rifles. So all I need to insert is tactics. 
Yeah, and tactics can be learned. Them. Yeah, yeah, they're not gonna. They they definitely don't want. I, I mean, the biggest army in the world is the American population, right? The armed army yep. in the world. Um, I think they're gonna have a hard time when they really get to the point where they're gonna try to take things away, though. And I'm not making threats. I'm not saying what I'm gonna do. I try to stay legal the best as I I, I can. But you you try to take the disarm the American people, you you biting off a lot, a lot. Yeah. And, and and I don't think it's going to you know in my, in my prediction, right? I don't think it's going to happen that way. I don't think there's ever going to be people trying to go door to door from the government, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think everything's going to crash before, right? They're they're just the way they're running this train right now. They're going to drive it straight into the ground. And it's just one day we're going to wake up and the government, you know, like I say, it might be five years, might be one year, might be tomorrow, might be 200 years down the road. We're going to wake up one day and the government's not going to be there. And it's just going to be lawlessness until other people step up to make governments. Right? Well, God willing, that will never happen. At and least, at least in our that. lifetime. Yeah. But that's right. why we got to be proactive in supporting the bills that we want to support, not supporting and, and, and supporting the legislators that we find actually working for us in the ways of their constituents. And, and at some point, I'm not, I'm not a guy that would tell anybody how to vote, to vote, not to vote. I think we should all, you know, do it because it makes the country better, but whichever way you vote is fine. Just make sure your representatives are representing you. And if they're not switch them out, either side doesn't matter. Yep. Active in the process. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that, and that's, I mean, and then, you know, bringing some reality back into it, I looked at the 2012, I looked at 2012, 2016, 2020 elections, right? And if you take those election numbers just for president, and if people go in there and don't vote for the president during a presidential election, probably super rare. I mean, I'm sure there's some, some that has happened. Sure. But if you look at just the presidential vote, and then you look at, franchised meaning they can vote people in the united states 50 percent of the population voted period right so it's it's a, they get a 51 percent of the vote right but only 50 percent of the population voted so the guy got 26 percent of the vote because if half the people don't show up the half the people there Yep, fifty one percent of that half. They got twenty six percent of the nation said that they could be the president. Right? And that's Yeah, and a lot of that comes to age and felonies and things of that nature because from right. one to eighteen you're not voting anyway. That's a large chunk of people. Uh yeah. how that shakes out. That's interesting that you bring that 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 you say it like that though, because that's true. It it'd be interesting to know how many people weren't able to vote. And take yeah. that off of the percentages, yeah, you know. The what I mean? numbers and you go and franchise people, even, even if those numbers are slightly off, we're still at like maybe thirty percent, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? It's it's not fifty one percent of the voting population, right? And it's definitely not fifty percent of the population of the country, right? And it just so it just chops down. So if we had people active, regardless of what flavor they were, right? People active then there's more accountability in it. Because if I only got to convince 25 to 40% of the population in my area that I'm a fucking great dude. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Then, 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 that, then that starts getting getting super easy. Um, you know, comparatively, especially in the days of social media. Right? Oh, yeah. Because I'm, I'm not sure how many connections and followers you got. You know, you, you, you got your book out. You've been doing this for a while. Yeah, I've got like, each, each of my channels has about 6,000 people on it. Mm -hmm. So I, I can do something. And if I post across all the things and I post it for two or three days, you know, I can reach 25,000 people. Sure. They're all willingly click that button. That's not even talking about the, you know, the, the, the non followers that, that are happening to see that thing. So e even I can reach, you know, 25, 30,000 people. And that if it happens to get super popular, you know, I, I've, my, my LinkedIn had a almost, I'm, I'm working towards it, but it's almost at a million impressions for a 365 day period. Wow. That's impressions. That's just, that's just somebody, somebody seeing my LinkedIn, right? Sure. And that's just me, me by myself doing that, right? Yeah. So yeah. With no campaign up, help, no funding. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, right, you can yeah, touch a lot of people me. for sure. Right. 
And so if I get, if I start doing a presidential campaign or I'm doing a, even a local campaign for the county and I get some money thrown behind it and I get to advertise and I get to do all that sort of stuff, you know, I can get a lot of people at least acknowledge that I'm there. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So then there, there are those things in your days of social media. When I when back to my grandpa's day when he was knocking on doors to my grandpa, ran, I remember he ran for a county clerk. Oh, grassroots spent, door to door. He, he spent weeks knocking on doors, having conversations, talking to people in, you know, anywhere you could talk to him, gas station, restaurants, all that sort of stuff. Sure. And even though everybody knew him, he didn't get the majority of the vote, so he didn't he didn't get elected to it. But that's a whole lot of work. You know, if, if I started planning that I wanted to run for president, you know, in, in six years, and I started on it now, and I started pushing on that, and I got some funding behind me because I'm a pro-gun candidate, fucking whatever, I get dudes that, you know, do a Patreon or GoFundMe or sure. some stuff that I can advertise. And then, you know, I'm going to get mentioned on CNN at, at the end of that. You know what I mean? So social media. Yeah, that's playing the long game too, um, which I think a lot of people are doing now, especially in politics. Some of the younger guys getting in are playing that longer game. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think with social media, we're all three jumps away from everybody. That's the way I, that's yeah. the way I feel. It's a, it's a three jump system. And the reason I know that it works is because that's what the CIA and the FBI used to spy on American citizens is three jumps that like it's in their yeah. doctrine. Um, so we're three jumps from everybody across the entire planet. It's a, it's a matter of putting a campaign together that resonates with the people. Right. Uh, and, and whatever you're doing, whether you're doing shooting guns, whether you're podcasting, whether you're telling war stories yeah. or whether you're in politics, you can touch them, but you, you have to be authentic in your approach and you have to have the right approach. Um, yep. what's crazy about today's world is that the generational, you know, things are shifting and the generations, you know, Z or whatever, you know, they want to call it's coming up. Their attention span span is super small. Right. And so what I found is the, the shorter, uh, clips and the shorter, uh, jazzed up with music and flashy things. That's what this new generation likes to see. And if you can yeah. get them with some of that, then they'll actually come and watch your longer stuff. But they're very, very short on their attention span. Uh, yeah, so you know, you know, think about a, you know, a sixty-minute conversation, right? You, you basically need to talk to that person for sixty minutes, and you need to do it six to nine seconds at a time. That's right. And if you can plan that out. And you can get them to hear your entire 60 minutes. By the end of that 60 minutes, they're, they're going to be on your side. Sure. Right? Sure. Yeah, it's all about the approach for sure. And, uh, and the biggest thing that we're lacking, just, you know, we're, we've been on here a while, but the biggest thing that we're lacking in the gun industry and the second amendment supporters and all that sort of stuff is leadership. Mm-hmm. That That is the biggest thing that we're lacking because – what happens is every time somebody rises up towards the top and they've got a plan, everybody that thinks that they're mad at him for making money, then they tear that guy down. Smash him, they, they yep. Drag, they drag him back down as a, the monkey's theory or whatever it is, right? And it starts trying to climb up the ladder and they yank him back down, right? Mm-hmm. So what, what would be nice is to have somebody that, that is on message, that has leadership qualities, you know, and everyone were asking for crazy things, but is also independently wealthy, right? Because I'm going to lose my job, right? When they try to tear me down, they're going to dox me. I'm going to lose my job and, you know, do these things. They're going to, going to try to control like, me through money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, control me through money. Um, then they're going to try and, you know, block me here, block me there. So I need to be have enough wealth that I can sit around for 22 hours out of the day chasing the rabbit, right? But I need to do leadership. And as soon as I get to be to a point where I'm a good leader and I'm starting to get a following, then the government's going to come crashing down on me because they know what I'm trying to do. Right. Yeah. So I have to, I have to be able to have lawyers and all this sort of stuff, but we need to have leadership that can bond those 300 companies together, whatever they are, can bond those companies together. You mean almost like a, like a leader of a lobby for that, for that world in, in particular, yeah. like the AR world, let's say, or the, or the uh, assault weapon world. Yeah. Yeah, I see and, what you're saying. I, I, I talked about it on a on a podcast a while back. Um, it has been been a few years now. Um, but all these gun laws are like a ratchet. They they go and they go and they go, and once they get that click, it doesn't go back, right? Yep. So 
if everybody that that, the, that they say all 40 million of those people that have a pistol brace right if i could get all 40 of them the million people of them on message not call me a bootlicker and a cuck because i'm going to register my stuff because that's what i'm you know understand to do to stay legal yeah not call me that if 40 million people were on message yeah that would change quick yeah, think about what we could do. Yeah. Because if I, if I walk in with the voice of 40 million people, I guarantee I could get, with 40 million people behind me, I could get into the Senate. Fact. I could probably get, in, get into the White House. Fact. Uh, say, fact. Like said, yeah. So I've got that. But we can't get everybody on message. So we need that leadership to at least get everybody on the same message. I don't care if it's a meme page. Right? Yeah. Instagram got the meme pages and you know, they're doing all those things. I don't care if it's a meme page. If the memes are on message and everybody is following that, then that person is going to get paid attention. You know what else? It, it would be really nice if when these, you know, new laws and new rules and everything come out, like it was advertised to people from the ATF. And, and maybe they do this and I'm just not finding it, but it should be thoroughly explained for people like you did here. But I don't, that's not your responsibility. It should be the responsibility of the ATF if they're going to make that rule to thoroughly explain this to everybody. But they're not going to do that. They're going to say, we wrote it down, we advertised it once, and it's your responsibility as a gun owner. And, and like, I get it, but I, it would make things a whole lot. Like, sometimes it's clear as mud when they write something out. And then, like, they've, they've had certain rules where I've asked guys at the ATF to come on to the show and explain it, and they refused to come on because they said they didn't understand it properly to explain it. And it's like, well, you're the agent that's supposed to enforce this. So it's yeah. like that part of it is discouraging to me because it's 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 little elite levers of power at the top that are deciding what they want to do and what they you know what they want to vote on and and then you're left in the you know kind of as an american gun owner even as a law abiding citizen you're kind of left in the dark to till they make up their mind and then you have to go reach out and find out what it is that they said and how to interpret it and so that 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 gets frustrating to me and and they they've got the same phone because I because the computer messed up and I had to get on the phone, uh, which is about to run out of power. But the uh, they got the same capabilities that we got, mm-hmm. and they and they could put that new guy in his little suit, and he could sit there and he could do a, a public service announcement on the new bill. Yeah, salary, whatever. If, yep. it, if it took him eight hours to explain this thing, and put it onto the YouTube, and fucking go there and we could be like what do i got to do and he could be like all right bottom line up front you got to register you got to turn in you got to turn in nfa but yep. here's why yeah right? and it's the atf dude saying yep that's how it should be yep that's how it should be and get my stamps back in like 48 hours i mean how hard is it <laughs> yeah and is that an it yeah i don't know that's a whole lot of an issue probably uh yeah. as far as you know what would you say twenty thousand a month they're able to do so yeah. that's manpower then yeah, it's manpower, and they just they just got forty million dollars added to their budget, and didn't add a single person to that shop. Imagine that. Yeah, and and, and those people volunteer for it. They volunteer for that job, and they're working that job. But man, yeah, they're they're doing twenty thousand a week, and they got like twenty people in there, so they're looking at a thousand stamps a week. And then they <laughs> more they than that if you more than that if you're canceling any of them if they don't make yeah. it. And, mm. and if you walk in, when you walk into the building, because you know they don't have a corner office, they walk through this building, they pass by like 200 motherfuckers that aren't doing shit. Yep. And they're in there fucking <clears throat> going as fast <throat> as they can and and just trying to fucking hammer them out. Yep. And it's just, just stupid. Just stupid. Well, Ash Hess, I appreciate you coming on and talking to me uh, uh, this no evening. I look forward to picking your brain more in the future. Maybe not so much online yeah. here, but if we can put some PSAs through like Instagram lives out, that's all, that's yeah. another way that I'm, I'm trying to push information out. So maybe we can link up on that and run this back. Maybe some more of the ATF side as it continues to develop. Um, yeah. But man, I appreciate your service to the country. I appreciate your service uh, in the gun world because I'm a gun fanatic. Um, I love them and, uh, and I love learning more about it. So, and I also appreciate you, you know, clearing up some of the stuff that you've cleared up on, on here with us today. So I appreciate you and we'll see you later. All right, guys, for choices, not chances. This is Ryan signing off. Well, that concludes this episode. Thanks for listening to choices, not chances podcast.
please share, like, and subscribe wherever you listen or watch our podcast. You can also follow us on social media at Choices Not Chances Podcast. Thanks, and have a great day. Louisiana Gun Shop, your firearm headquarters, specializing in concealed carry guns, ammo, and training. You can get your Louisiana permit with us. Also, a large selection of AR-15s, or if you are that build-it-yourself type of guy or gal, we have all the parts to build and customize your own AR-15. Glock, Sig, Taurus, Ruger. We have all the brands, both in the store or at louisianagunshop.com. Not too far. You're marking the building. Hit him. Yeah, that's good. That's a good shot. That's a funny. Yeah. Yeah.